We are in the book of Acts, uh, in the passage that Virginia read, so let's pray as we come to our text to learn what the Lord wants to speak to our hearts today. Gracious Heavenly Father, would you prepare us for your word? Lord, I pray that we would come today with an appetite and that we would come hungry to hear, as we learned last week, to hear your voice through this text. May we not just hear you today, but may we respond to you. And may we become more Christ-like through what we learn. In the name of Jesus, amen. How many of you have ever taken a tough, cut of meat and tried to cook it and prepare it and it just turned out terrible i've done it and how many of you know that in order to prepare a certain type of meat whether it's like a shank or a, a roast cut you need to do some things to it first before you cook it and one of the main things you do is you can marinate it for a while right and you can let it soak or you can brine it or do something. Today what we're going to talk about is we are going to talk about the need that we have when it comes to sharing the gospel. To not just share the gospel with people, but to do a little marinating first. All right, So that we can help with uh, breaking down barriers. We can help with softening hearts. And help with the Holy Spirit's work of people becoming more receptive to hearing the gospel message. Two weeks ago, we were introduced to Cornelius, a God-fearer who lived in Caesarea, and we were challenged in that passage on how he lived counterculturally to Rome as best he could. We were taught that in order to participate and serve in the kingdom of God, we need to learn to assimilate minimally to American culture and do our best to remain allegiant to God as much as possible. As I was reflecting back on that message that I shared two weeks ago, I wanted to bring to us the idea that us being in this room together, us gathering weekly here together, is an act of resisting the American empire. Because America wants us to be tribal. It wants us to like connect with our own people, people that are just like us. It wants to divide us along racial lines. It wants to divide us along age lines. It wants to divide us along socioeconomic lines and keep us all huddled together with people that are just like us, same age, same stage of life, same, same income, all of those things. And we are defying the American empire by forming a multicultural diverse church here in Uptown. And this is a witness and a testimony, what we do here weekly. And it could be easier, I know, for us to maybe go find a church where people look more like us or maybe they have the same skin color as us or maybe they're more people in our age bracket or maybe people that maybe relate a little bit easier to us. But what we do here is in defiance to that, that ease and that comfort. And we say, no, we are going to do something different. It might be more difficult and we are resisting the American empire by being here. Did you know that you're doing that this morning? Pretty amazing, right? Pat yourself on the back. Last week, we talked about Peter's vision and how through God, the vision that God gave Peter, God spoke to him in a variety of different ways and got Peter's attention with a variety of forms of communication. And we learned all of these different ways that God speaks to us, and hopefully we can better hear his voice by knowing how he likes to communicate to us. Today, we encounter the last scene in the story where it is going to climax with Peter preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. Our text here is laying out the initial meeting between Peter and Cornelius as they sort of get to know one another. Peter arrives in Caesarea, he enters Cornelius' house, he meets Cornelius, and he hears from him why he was sent for. And this is a very historic moment, even though you might not recognize that or realize this, for Peter to enter into Cornelius' house, the Jew going into the Gentile's house, this is a very monumental moment. What happens in these verses are the very last things that take place before Peter preaches the gospel message about Jesus and invites all the Gentile believers gathered in Cornelius' home to become followers of Jesus. And there is an estimation that because of who Cornelius was, his rank as a centurion, and the type of home that he probably had in Caesarea, 
that there was probably 40 to 50 people gathered in the home ready to hear the gospel. But what we find here before Peter preaches the gospel are a couple of things that take place that I think lays the groundwork and helps prepare everybody to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say in that moment. Oftentimes, we need to understand that there is pre-work that needs to be done before we try to directly lead somebody to Christ. Oftentimes, there is pre-work Things that we do, activities that we engage in, things, uh, uh, ways that we interact with people that help prepare a person for hearing the gospel. Especially if there's barriers in place. And that's what we have here. We have a lot of barriers between Jew and Gentile. And now many of us, myself included, were discipled into the urgency of needing to share the gospel with people. When I was being raised in church, it was critical, high priority, most important thing that you and I can do is share our faith and get people to say yes to Jesus, pray a sinner's prayer, lead them through the Romans road, all of these different things. We needed, I was like, people would say things like this from the pulpit. You're walking down the sidewalk. You make eye contact with someone. You have an opportunity to stop and share Jesus with that person, but you don't, and they walk by and get hit by a car, and they die, and you've missed your moment, right? Like, a man, like that's the pressure, right? Like, that's the pressure that I experienced as a young man of, like, why it was so important because, man, that encounter you have with that person might be the very last thing before they die, or it might be the only time they ever hear the gospel, and if you refuse to share, how are they going to come to know Jesus? So you live with this pressure. I lived with this pressure. Can anybody relate to this pressure of being like, oh, we've got to be telling people about Jesus? This led to us in our youth group. We would go down to, uh, I went to church in Naperville. And in Naperville downtown, there's this river walk, really beautiful river walk. I don't know if you've been there or been able to go down there before or not. But on the weekends, this is where a lot of teenagers liked to hang out. So our youth group, we would go down there on the weekends and we would just witness on the river walk under this immense pressure of knowing like, we need people to come to Jesus. Our attempts and our efforts were pretty fruitless. But we had a lot of zeal. We had a lot of passion. Yes, Peter is about to preach the gospel. He is about to share the good news of Jesus here in Caesarea. But before he preaches, there's a couple of different things that happen in our passage that unfold first. And I believe that what we see unfold in this passage is very important and necessary for us to do some of this same pre-work before we preach the gospel to people. What transpires here, I think, helps remove some of the barriers, some of the obstacles that would have been present in that house as Jew and Gentile were coming together. There would have been hostility there. There would have been distrust there. There would have been fear in the room. There would have been just a lot of different things happening and a lot of reasons why people would be putting up a resistance and not wanting to be attentive potentially. How many of you know that we live in a day and age where there are all sorts of barriers that need to be overcome, that need to be torn down. There are chasms that need to be bridged before people are ready and receptive to hear the gospel. You and I live in a day and age where there is immense resistance to Christianity. There's a lot of different factors and there's a lot of different reasons why these barriers and these chasms exist. The church has been known to abuse and misuse power. We have been known to uh, be greedy and manipulative when it comes to money. The church has participated in racism and discrimination. Misogyny has run rampant through the church. Hate speech has been part of the church. Christian nationalism, hostility between denominations, the practice of shunning, the perceived intolerance and the real intolerance, all of the ulterior motives and agendas, all of the different deception. We have 
historical evidence of years upon years, centuries upon centuries of corruption and evil within the institution of the church. And so what people see, what people read, what people experience, and what people believe about Christianity has created many barriers in their life to them not wanting to be receptive to the gospel. And who can blame people, right? You and I have to recognize this and understand that our zealous approach that we often take to try to lead somebody into a sinner's prayer is not maybe that helpful because our passion and our quickness can unintentionally actually build walls higher and stretch out the chasm further. But there are things that we can and should do that I believe in conjunction with the Holy Spirit to help lower the walls, help build bridges, and help remove obstacles. Martin Luther King Jr. was famous for saying, let's build bridges, not walls. What I'm going to offer to us this morning isn't formulaic. I don't think this is how we should approach every single encounter. But I believe there's some wisdom that we're going to find in our passage today where we can be led by the Holy Spirit into helping people be more ready to hear the good news of Jesus. And let me say here at the front, sometimes God will lead you and I to an individual who is ripe and ready to hear the gospel. And we need to take advantage of that opportunity. It's not that everyone is always going to have a barrier. It's not that there's always going to be an obstacle. I just know that from my experience, it's more normal for there to be barriers than for a person to be ripe and ready to go. Yes, the Holy Spirit is at work whenever we preach the gospel. But I believe the Holy Spirit is also at work wanting to use us as tools and instruments to help dismantle the walls that people are fortressing themselves behind, blocking themselves off from faith. So let's look at what happens here before Peter preaches the gospel, what he does, what happens in the room, which helps, I believe, break down some of these barriers. And I believe if we commit to our commit ourselves to some of these same practices, we will be better equipped to help lead people to Christ when that moment comes. The first thing that we see happening in our passage is a breaking down of barriers with hospitality. A breaking down of barriers with hospitality. Verse 23, the first thing we see here, it says, Peter, this is before Peter goes to Caesarea. The men have come to invite Peter, but Peter first invites the men into the house he's staying at to be his guests, it says. And then the next day, Peter goes out with them and some of the other believers from Joppa accompany him. And then he arrives in Caesarea, it says, and it says Cornelius was expecting them and had called together all of his relatives and close friends. Friends. So the passage here shows Peter showing hospitality to Cornelius's men who come to him at Joppa. And then you've got Cornelius welcoming Peter and his traveling companions into his home. And both of these things are really big deals because this just was not done in the world at that time. Jews did not invite Gentiles into their homes. Gentiles did not invite Jews into their homes. From a Jew's perspective, many Jews would not even rent land to a Gentile. They wouldn't even rent a home that they owned to a Gentile. To welcome a Gentile into your home as your guest would mean you are going to provide lodging and food for that person. And in Jubilees 22, 16, one of these Jewish apocryphal texts, it says, separate yourself from the Gentiles and do not eat with them. Did you know that it was believed by Jews, not every Jew, but a lot of Jews, that they could not even bring kosher food to a meal with Gentiles? Because you'd be thinking like, well, why couldn't like everyone prepare their food separately? No big deal. They can come. They can eat together. That should work out just fine. But it was believed. Jewish people believed that if they brought kosher food to a meal where there were Gentiles present, if they needed to leave the room for a minute to attend to something, the Gentile would purposefully contaminate their food. Like that was like the level of hostility. And I don't think that was true. I, mean, I don't know. I can't tell you, but like that type of thinking 
was leading to why they would never share meals together. I believe the Holy Spirit was at work during these moments of hospitality before the gospel was preached. These moments where Peter welcomed the men into his home and then Cornelius welcoming Peter into his home. This idea of showing care for one another, eating meals to get together, this began to lower the barriers between the two sides. Can you imagine, I'm guessing it was a couple of day walking journey from, Jeru from Joppa to Caesarea and now you've got uh, them walking together, companions, Cornelius' companions, Peter's companions. They're traveling together. They're sharing stories together. They're sleeping together. They're eating together. They're making the journey together. I would imagine relationship was being formed as Peter was making his way to Caesarea. We need to be hospitable people that welcome others into our life. And in order to provide effective hospitality, it is going to require our time, it is going to require our care, and it is going to require our generosity. We need to be people who open up our lives and open up our homes and offer what we have to others, even if it is meager or small. Showing hospitality is not just about offering extravagant things to people, but it is about offering who we are and what we have in care for somebody else. Showing hospitality to people who are wary of us. Showing hospitality to people who have a distrust maybe in us or in the fact that we are Christians. Helping to lower their defenses to say, wow, this person actually cares about me. There's an old saying, I think, that it was President Roosevelt that said it. People don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People don't care what you know about Jesus until they know that you love them. Hospitality is what we do to show people that we care. We give our time. We give our love. We give our generosity. We share our resources. We open up our homes. We invite people to our tables. I've seen it over and over again. I've experienced it myself. There is something miraculous that takes place around a table with food. I don't know if you can attest to this or not, but eating with people has an almost magical quality to it. When you share food, especially in homes with people, it accomplishes something relationally that doesn't seem we can replicate or duplicate any other way to relax together, partake together, share together. The table becomes this spiritual place that's almost like an altar where God does something really wonderful in our lives when we come and we kneel at the altar. God does something special between individuals when they gather around a table to eat together, to commune together, to be together. The people that we're praying for, our friends, our relatives, our coworkers, our acquaintances, our neighbors, the people that we want to come to know Jesus, we must extend hospitality to them. We must welcome them in, invite them over, cook for them, spend time with them, share food together in the midst of our busy culture where we just don't even have time to cook for ourselves. We're like, I got to use DoorDash. I got to use Grubhub. I got to like, I just got to go through the drive through right? Like, like the meals have become like we eat in our cars. We eat on the train. Like we've got to create an environment in our life where we can begin to show hospitality, inviting people in, sitting around the table saying, you are worth my time and I want to be with you. And through our hospitality, I believe the Holy Spirit is at work breaking down barriers. When we practice hospitality with Christ at the center, which is key, we have to be intentionally um, hospitable, knowing that we are wanting to be Christ-like and invite others towards Christ. It's more than just us being kind to people. We must understand that we are bringing God's love to people in tangible, incarnational ways. Did you know that Martin Luther, who, not Martin Luther King Jr., but the old Martin Luther, who did the 95 Theses, um, who reformed, like who brought the Reformation, helped bring the Reformation about, one of the things that he was most known for as a professor when he was teaching was his hospitality. He would always, it was just known that he always had his house open. There was always students over. There was always faculty over. He was a big beer drinker. Uh, it was known of the guy. And there was always like 
intense conversations that would happen around the table. They were always eating together, drinking together. People, and, and like, this is just something that he had constantly hosting people, him and his wife, in their home. In the book, The Hospitality Commands by Alexander Strauss, he says Martin Luther proved that the table is a splendid pulpit from which to teach God's truth and disciple God's people. If you want new Christians to grow, open your home and share your love and knowledge with them. Your home is the best tool you have to enhance loving Christian community. Your local church can become a friendlier, more loving community if you and others you know consistently open your homes to one another. The second way we see barriers being broken down here is not just with hospitality, but with humility. Look at verse 25. It says, as Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Now, there are some people that think that what Cornelius was doing here was actually trying to worship Peter as if Peter was a deity. The way Romans would worship Caesar. And that now Peter has to correct them. And I'm not so sure if this is the right theory. Maybe it is. The th I don't know. But there's also other people who advocate that Cornelius was not operating in a form of idolatry. But he was just deferring to him and asking. And it was a form of supplication. Falling at somebody's feet to, to ask for something. And Cornelius knew that Peter had something for him. So he places himself in a posture of receiving bowing before him so that he can receive whatever Peter has. Whatever the case is, I'm not going to make an argument for one or the other. I think in the center of what's happening here is there is a display of honor and humility taking place. And in return, as Cornelius is showing a humble posture, Peter also displays humility by rejecting being elevated. Maybe it's the act of worship that Peter is saying this should be reserved for God alone. Or maybe Peter is just recognizing that, no, we are equals. I've come to realize that my own Jewishness does not make me better than you, as most Jews had come to believe. But realizing that we are equals. Both of these would have been acts and displays of humility. And I think this would have been difficult for both of them to engage in. Both Jew and Gentile, they were in competition with each other. Who was superior? Who was more important? Cornelius would have been used to people deferring to him, honoring him, looking up to him. He was in a place of stature and leadership and prestige. And now you've got this humility being shown from a Roman centurion to a Jewish fisherman. That would have been surprising. Peter, he goes on to acknowledge in verse 28 that his thinking was faulty. That what he used to believe is no longer true. And that would have been surprising and humbling as well. When there are barriers and obstacles between people, it can be more tempting to show ourselves superior instead of humbling, humbly honoring people. When there is division, when there is strife, when there is hostility, we as humans, we want and would rather put ourselves into a position of superiority over somebody than to see one another as equals. I personally find that it is always easier to talk bad about people or criticize people that I don't approve of. Is anybody like me? No, of course not. But if you and I want people to come to Christ and respond to the gospel, we can't disparage them. It's not going to happen because we show disdain to people. It's not going to happen because we act better than people or come across with elite airs. Maybe it's because we feel like we're saved and they're not saved. They're just unclean sinners. No matter what, we should always be looking for reasons and ways that we can honor other people. Finding good in them, encouraging them, being respectful to them. And this is something that Christians have been notoriously bad at for a very long time. There's this posture that Christians like to take that we are holier than thou. Than thou. And that is not doing us any good in, in our witness of trying to draw people to Christ. And when what we do is put ourselves in a place of superiority, thinking I am better than somebody, we are not in a place where we are looking to honor anybody. 
we're actually in a place to look down at people. But what we need to be able to learn to do is look at people and value them as humans and say, you are no better than I, and I am no better than you. I am saved by grace. And on the flip side, like Peter, we should not be looking for people to worship us or put us up on a pedestal of any kind. We should not be craving or desiring people to see us as an important or a great person. We should be servants. We should honor other people. We should defer to others. We should encourage others because they don't know Christ and it doesn't make them less than us. They, don't, they still have good redeeming qualities about them and we should be respectful and treat everybody with dignity and we should love everybody and we should treat people better than ourselves. Learning to show honor is a fruit of Christian humility. Learning to show honor is a fruit of Christian humility. Can we honor people that don't know Christ? Or do we sort of just look down at them as a heathen? I recently had the privilege of hearing Dr. Dennis Edwards give a workshop on his new book, Humility Illuminated. He describes humility in this way. It is a way of life rooted in submission to God and it is demonstrated in actions that foster mutuality instead of competition. I like that. Humility is rooted in submission to God, and we demonstrate humility by fostering mutuality between, between us and others instead of competition. He says that it's not transactional, but it's a way of life. We don't act humble in order to get things from people. He says that humility will drive us to be peacemakers, it rejects superiority, real or imagined. He argues that people who demonstrate humility best are people who have been humiliated most in our society. People who are best at demonstrating humility are people who have been the most humiliated. And then he goes on to talk about humble people demonstrating vulnerability. They know how to listen. They're empathetic. They respect the marginalized and the weak, and they know how to admit failure and to apologize. So both Cornelius and Peter, upon meeting one another, are both demonstrating forms of humility towards one another. Cornelius honoring Peter, Peter recognizing them as equals, Peter admitting his faults, admitting he was wrong for calling Gentiles impure and unclean. And the question that you and I have to answer is, are we humble people or are we a proud and self-righteous people? Because if we go through this world with our pride and our self-righteousness, this is definitely a turnoff to people who are far from God. And us acting better than others or us trying to be more superior to others has never, ever been an effective tool for evangelism. Us judging people, us shaming people, us looking down on people, this is behavior that is very prevalent within the church and among Christians. And if people are going to come to Jesus... They need to experience a community of people who know what humility is, and they demonstrate it, and they live it out on a daily basis. And the third thing that happens with the breaking down of barriers is with honesty. So we see hospitality, humility, and now honesty. While talking with them in verse 27, Peter goes inside and finds a large gathering of people, and he says, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. And yes, Peter's humility is on display here, but I think it's also important to point out that his humility led him to being very honest in this moment. He was very honest with Cornelius. And all who were gathered, he admits that his, his fault was in the fact that he was living into Jewish discrimination against Gentiles. And he has now recognized that this is not God's intention. This is not God's design. And he acknowledges that his normal tendency, if God did not speak to him on the rooftop of Cornelius' house, would have been to reject the invitation to go to Caesarea. He's being honest to say that this is new. This is out of character for me. I'm learning something. I'm going through like, 
I'm recognizing and I'm processing and I'm beginning to understand and I'm beginning to see more clearly that I have been wrong and have lived wrong for most of my life. How many of you know that that is a really difficult thing to admit? Right? Like, if you, like how many years do I look back and realize as God is illuminating and showing me something like, oh my goodness, I was doing it wrong for a decade? Two decades? Three decades? <laughs> but people need to experience honesty from us. People don't need to come into church and find a bunch of people who are all pretending with one another. They don't need to find a bunch of people wearing masks of fake smiles, acting like we all like each other when we really don't, saying we are doing fine when we really aren't. They need to experience a community that is real and honest with each other, a community that accepts one another, a community where people are encouraged to be themselves, to bring the fullness of themselves into the spiritual family. People need to hear Christians apologize and say that we are wrong. They need to hear testimonies about how God was at work in our failures. God was at work in our screw-ups. We need to practice and demonstrate public repentance, not just individually as people, but communally as well. The church has often remained silent instead of acknowledging its own shortcomings. The church has often avoided their failures and then moved on as if they never did anything wrong in the first place. The church has harmed many, many people, but yet we have never truly publicly acknowledged or really, uh, uh, really faced it and owned it. The church, not all of it, but many aspects of the church is hiding from their complicity in racism. Not acknowledging what we have done. It might not have been us personally, but we can't even acknowledge the history of what we have been attached to and what we have been engaged in and where we are at now and the repair and the building that needs to be done. We would rather just not talk about it. We don't want to accept and acknowledge the way we have demonized the LGBTQ community. We don't want to talk about how wrong it's been for us to sell out to political forces and to become complicit in Christian nationalism. And these are just a few that I'm mentioning here this morning. We just want to move on. Even if we think that it's wrong, we're not willing to own it. We're not willing to come out and repent of it. We're not willing to say it the way Peter says it. Peter says, I was wrong. This is not God's intention. This is not God's design. So we need to be able to step up and say, we as a community, we've been wrong. I've been wrong. My thinking's been flawed. I've made mistakes. I'm now coming into the realization. Sometimes we come into a realization of something new, and then we just act like we've had that realization our entire life. Because we want to come across like we are a competent person. Do you know what I'm saying? So like, like in my life, becoming more awake to how race plays out in society, it would be super easy for me to just act like I've known this my entire life. But it's not true, it's not real. So I have to be honest and admit that I have had to learn some things, I've had to unlearn some things, I behaved terribly in the past, my knowledge, what I knew, I was discipled and raised up in something in a church community that didn't recognize and was complicit, right? We have to say these things. We have to acknowledge these things. We have to be truthful about them. In his book, The Color of Compromise, Jamar Tisby writes, History and scripture teaches us that there can be no reconciliation without repentance. There can be no repentance without confession. There can be no confession without truth. Without truth, there is no justice. Without truth, there is no reconciliation between humans, and there is no way to reconcile us to God without truth as well. We need to become people that are super honest. And that role, we think that by being honest, we are going to repel people, but we're not. People are going to respect you and I more if we can be real. We 
We have to be vulnerable. We have to share our shortcomings. We win people to Christ, not by telling them the truth about themselves, but by telling the truth about ourselves. Hear me, church. Our evangelism tactic has been about me telling you why you need Jesus. Me telling you why you're a sinner. Me telling you why you need to come to the cross. But that is not an effective form of, of evangelism. If you and I can get it into our heads that people will become more receptive if we tell more of the truth about ourselves and give a testimony about how God saved us, God transformed us, that's way more appealing than someone hearing from you and I why they need Jesus. Start talking to people why, why you needed Jesus and why you still need Jesus. Be honest about it. As we close this morning, there are a multitude of barriers that prevent many people from walking through the doors of a church, from wanting to be around a Christian, from wanting to be associated with Christians. There's many people that have no desire of ever wanting to become a Christian because of all of the obstacles, chasms, and barriers that have been built up or created. And you and I are never going to help overcome these barriers and be effective at leading people to Christ if all we do is just tell people Jesus is the way, Jesus is the truth, Jesus is the life, and you are a sinner that needs grace. And while that message does need to be preached, and while that truth does need to be said, that needs to be done in conjunction with some of the other things that we have talked about. The pre-work, the marinade, the stuff that comes before it. Because if we don't do all of this other stuff first, it is just going to be deflected off of a hard shell. My friends, there is work that needs to be done through the power of the Holy Spirit that lays the groundwork for the gospel to be shared. Peter didn't just come into Cornelius' house and proclaim the gospel, but we see these things taking place in preparation for the gospel to be shared. And it is this type of work that lowers the obstacles. It helps bridge the divides using hospitality, humility, and honesty. These three practices and these markers work wonders where we see division, strife, distrust, hostility all at play. But if we're going to be hospitable, it requires our care and it requires our time. If it, we are going to display humility, it requires surrender to God, honoring and respecting others. And if we're going to be honest, we must be vulnerable and be a people of confession. For the seed of the gospel to take root in somebody's life, it has to be planted in good soil. I believe hospitality, humility, and honesty will help create a fertile soil in the life of people that we come across. And then, once we have used these tools and these markers in our life, then sharing the good news of Jesus becomes more effective. It's not just about handing out a tract. It's not about just trying to get somebody to walk the Romans road. It's not trying to just get people to repeat a prayer after us. Sharing the good news of Jesus is about us living in such a way that people see and experience a Christ-likeness in us that helps break down their barriers and dismantle their stereotypes and, and destroy the false assumptions on what they have about who and what a Christian should be. So I'm here this morning to encourage us as a church, we need to be hospitable. Open up our homes, open up our lives, invite people to our tables, welcome them in, cook for them, share with them, spend time with them, be lavish and extravagant and show such radical care for the people around you. Let's be humble. Let's encourage people. Let's speak into people's lives the good of what we see in them. Let's seek common ground and mutuality with people. Let's praise people when we see them living in a way that honors God, even if they are far from God. Let's consider the needs of the outcast and the marginalized. Let's do the work of being a humble people. And finally, let's be honest. Let's ask for forgiveness. Let's allow God to use the parts of our testimony that we don't want to share. 
the parts that might paint us into a bad light or bring on feelings of shame or regret, stuff that maybe we don't want to admit to other people. But what you know what? If God redeemed it, God can use it. So we don't need to hide that. Man, we might have been, we might have been the worst of the worst. So let's be honest about who we were and say, I'm no longer like that. Because God has changed me. And God has transformed me. Don't ignore or shy away from the sins and the shortcomings of the church. Let's admit them. Let's acknowledge them. And let's say we've got work to do. We have room to grow. We haven't arrived. And I think if we can do this, if we can be a people of hospitality, a people of humility, and a people of honesty, opportunities are going to come our way. Doors are going to open. Defenses are going to come down. Space is going to be created. Room for people in their hearts and their ears to hear and respond to the love of Jesus because we have begun to marinate them through the work of the Holy Spirit with these wonderful tools and resources at our disposal. I want the world to come to know Jesus. I want this community. That is why I'm here. That is why I planted this church. I want many, many people to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and turn their lives over to him and be transformed. But it's not just going to happen because I preach from this pulpit every Sunday. It is going to be because of the way that we love people, care for people, are humble, and the way we are honest as well. So would you pray with me today? Our gracious Heavenly Father, there is a world that needs Jesus. There are many, many people who are far from you. for whatever the reasons are, there are so many people who are hostile to you, hostile to the church, want nothing to do with Christianity. And I pray that we can begin to help lower and break through those barriers. Help dismantle those obstacles. Help build bridges over the essence of this message is make us more like Jesus. Lord, we don't need to be more effective at communicating about Jesus. Lord, we need help becoming more like Jesus. And may our light so shine. And may we be a city on the hill. Here and out town. May this church be a collective of individuals how to be hospitable, marked with humility, and unafraid of being hostile. And then may the gospel go forth, and may lives be transformed, and may people come to know you. And we pray this in